First book of Kings, we're in chapter 21. I haven't got quite so many notes as usual tonight, so we may be a little shorter. We'll see, I don't know. First Kings chapter 21, the story of Naboth and his vineyard. It came to pass after these things, verse 1, that Naboth the Jezreelite had a vineyard which was in Jezreel, hard by the palace of Ahab king of Samaria. And Ahab spake unto Naboth, saying, Give me thy vineyard, that I may have it for a garden of herbs, because it is near unto my house. And I will give thee for it a better vineyard than it, or if it seem good to thee, I will give thee the worth of it in money. And Naboth said to Ahab, The Lord forbid it me that I should give the inheritance of my fathers unto thee. And Ahab came into his house heavy and displeased because of the word which Naboth the Jezreelite had spoken to him, for he had said, I will not give thee the inheritance of my fathers. And he laid him down upon his bed and turned away his face and would eat no bread. But Jezebel his wife came to him and said unto him, Why is thy spirit so sad that thou eatest no bread? And he said unto her, Because I spake unto Naboth the Jezreelite, and said unto him, Give me thy vineyard for money, or else if it please thee, I will give thee another vineyard for it. And he answered, I will not give thee my vineyard. And Jezebel his wife said unto him, Dost thou now govern the kingdom of Israel? Arise and eat bread, and let thine heart be merry. I will give thee the vineyard of Naboth the Jezreelite. So she wrote letters in Ahab's name, and sealed them with his seal, and sent letters unto the elders and to the nobles that were in his city dwelling with Naboth. And she wrote in the letters, saying, Proclaim a fast, and set Naboth on high among the people, and set two men, sons of Belial, before him, to bear witness against him, saying, Thou didst blaspheme God and the king, and then carry him out, and stone him, that he may die. And the men of his city, even the elders and the nobles, who were the inhabitants of his city, did as Jezebel had sent unto them, and as it was written in the letters which she had sent unto them. They proclaimed a fast, and set Naboth on high among the people. And there came in two men, children of Belial, and sat before him. And the men of Belial witnessed against him, even against Naboth, in the presence of the people, saying, Naboth did blaspheme God and the king. Then they carried him forth out of the city, and stoned him with stones that he died. Then they sent to Jezebel, saying, Naboth is stoned, and is dead. It came to pass, when Jezebel heard that Naboth was stoned, and was dead, that Jezebel said to Ahab, Arise, take possession of the vineyard of Naboth the Jezreelite, which he refused to give thee for money, for Naboth is not alive, but dead. And it came to pass, when Ahab heard that Naboth was dead, that Ahab rose up to go down to the vineyard of Naboth the Jezreelite, to take possession of it. And the word of the Lord came to Elijah the Tishbite, saying, Arise, go down to meet Ahab, king of Israel, which is in Samaria. Behold, he is in the vineyard of Naboth, whither he has gone down to possess it. And thou shalt speak unto him, saying, Thus saith the Lord, Hast thou killed, and also taken possession? And thou shalt speak unto him, saying, Thus saith the Lord, In the place where the dogs licked the blood of Naboth, shall dogs lick thy blood, even thine. And Ahab said to Elijah, Hast thou found me, O mine enemy? And he answered, I have found thee, because thou hast sold thyself to work evil in the sight of the Lord. Behold, I will bring evil upon thee, and will take away thy posterity, and will cut off from Ahab him that pisseth against the wall, and him that is shut up and left in Israel. And I will make thine house like the house of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, and like the house of Baasha, sorry, Baasha, the son of Ahijah, for the provocation wherewith thou hast provoked me to anger, and made Israel to sin. And of Jezebel also spake the Lord, saying, The dogs shall eat Jezebel by the wall of Jezreel. Him that dieth of Ahab in the city, the dogs shall eat, and him that dieth in the field shall the fowls of the air eat. But there was none like unto Ahab, which did sell himself to work wickedness in the sight of the Lord, whom Jezebel his wife stirred up. And he did very abominably in following idols, according to all things, as did the Amorites, whom the Lord cast out before the children of Israel. It came to pass, when Ahab heard those words, that he rent his clothes, and put sackcloth upon his flesh, and fasted, and lay in sackcloth, and went softly. And the word of the Lord came to Elijah the Tishbite, saying, Seest thou how Ahab humbleth himself before me? 
Because he humbleth himself before me, I will not bring the evil in his days, but on his son's days will I bring the evil upon his house. So we look at Naboth's vineyard tonight, and we're going to look at it um, as, a, as a picture of prophecy. Uh, because it is a chapter, it's a story that very much concerns the Lord Jesus and the things of the future. Uh, and so that's the line we're going to take. There might be one or two, hopefully there'll be more than one or two practical lessons uh, as well tonight. Uh, but we're going to be looking at the story as it has to do with prophecy. Um, so Naboth has a vineyard. I love the phrase in verse 1, hard by the palace king of Samaria. Some great phrases in the old King James Bible. It means close next door, obviously. Hard by the palace uh, of Ahab, the king of Samaria. Um, and the vineyard, of course, speaks prophetically of Israel. If you want to turn with me to Isaiah chapter 5. Isaiah and chapter 5. And we'll see this. It's very clear here. Verse 1. Now will I sing to my well-beloved a song of my beloved touching his vineyard. My well-beloved hath a vineyard in a very fruitful hill. And he fenced it and gathered out the stones thereof and planted it with the choicest vine. And built a tower in the midst of it and also made a wine press therein. And he looked that it should bring forth grapes, and he brought forth wild grapes. And now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge, I pray you, betwixt me and my vineyard, what could have been done more to my vineyard that I have not done in it? Wherefore, when I looked that it should bring forth grapes, brought it forth wild grapes. And now go to, I will tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will take away the hedge thereof, and it shall be eaten up, and break down the wall thereof, and it shall be trodden down. And I will lay it waste, it shall not be pruned nor digged, but there shall come up briars and thorns. I will also command the clouds that they rain no rain upon it. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel, and the men of Judah his pleasant plant. And he looked for judgment, but behold oppression, for righteousness, but behold a cry. So there clearly we're told the Lord is talking about a vineyard here. And this is very plainly in verse 7, the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel. So when we're thinking about Naboth's vineyard, we need to keep Israel in mind. Have a look also at Matthew chapter 21. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 21. And we'll see that the same thing is spoken in the New Testament regarding Israel by the Lord Jesus himself. Matthew 21, and reading at verse 33. Here another parable. There was a certain householder which planted a vineyard and hedged it round about, and digged a wine press in it, and built a tower, and let it out to husbandmen, and went into a far country. And when the time of the fruit drew near, he sent his servants to the husbandmen, that they might receive the fruits of it. And the husbandman took his servants and beat one and killed another and stoned another. Again he sent other servants more than the first and they did unto them likewise. But last of all he sent to them his son saying they will reverence my son. But when the husbandman saw the son they said among themselves this is the heir. Come let us kill him and let us seed on his inheritance. And they caught him and cast him out of the vineyard and slew him. And um, it's quite clear as you read on, if you're not familiar with the story, I trust most of you are, uh, that further down, if you look at verse 45, for example, in chapter 21 here, when the chief priests and parables, sorry, chief priests and Pharisees had heard his parables, they perceived that he spake of them. So the Lord here again is, is picking up, if you will, on the prophecy of Isaiah and likening Israel to a vineyard and those who ought to be minding the vineyard as the, as the leaders who... Um, were not doing so. And notice what they said also um, in verse 38, in what we just read in Matthew here, verse 38. But when the husbandmen saw the son, they said among themselves, this is the heir. So uh, the vineyard is Israel, and it is also the inheritance of the Lord Jesus Christ. Just as that vineyard was Naboth's inheritance handed down to him from his father's, 
that he in turn would hand on down to his children. So the nation of Israel is the Lord's vineyard, he tells us very clearly that, and also it is the inheritance of the Lord Jesus Christ. Interestingly, the same is said of the whole earth. If you have a look at Psalm 2, Psalm 2, where the Father is speaking to the Son in verse 8, or rather the, the, the Lord Jesus is speaking of the Father's promise, verse 8, Ask of me, the Father says to the Son, and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance, and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. So Israel, of course, is, is specially so, specially the inheritance of the Lord Jesus. He will rule in Jerusalem, but Psalm 2 tells us that the, old, the whole earth will be his inheritance. And Naboth, we read, is the heir uh, to this vineyard, and so he's a type and he's a picture of the Lord Jesus, and we'll see that if you're not aware of that, we'll see that more clearly, I trust, as we proceed. Verse 3, Naboth said to Ahab, we're back in 1 Kings 21 now, Naboth said to Ahab, the Lord forbid it me that I should give the inheritance of my fathers unto thee. Uh, there are a number of places, we won't read them, but the Israelites were not supposed to give up their inheritance. Uh, if, they, if one of them became poor and he had to sell his land, he would get it back in the year of Jubilee. Um, and they were never to sell them, I believe I'm right in saying, they were never to sell them to those outside of the tribes of Israel. They could sell them, I think, between the tribes, but they were always to go back to the owner in the year of Jubilee, and they were never to permanently sell their lands. Um, and what was true tribally, if you will, is also true nationally. Uh, God is never going to take the land away. Israel is never going to lose their land. Uh, as you know, the Arab nations surrounding Israel uh, want the um, they want the eastern border of Israel to be the Mediterranean Sea. They want they don't want them to have any land at all. Num number of them certainly Ahmadinejad uh, has, has uh, said that he wants to wipe out he wants to wipe the nation of Israel off the face of the earth. They want to take away the Arab nations want to take away the inheritance of the Lord. Uh, and though they might have a measure of success. Uh, God is going to recover it, as we know from the scriptures, and the Lord Jesus is going to rule. And in fact, the nation will be far bigger, the boundaries will be far bigger when the Lord Jesus comes than they are now, stretching out way off to the, to the east into the lands that are now occupied by the Arabs. Quite the reverse of what the Arabs are hoping and expecting. Israel is going to spread east and west out to the, to the west to the sea and much further out to the east, taking up many of the lands uh, now owned by the Arabs. Um, it's God's inheritance and though the Antichrist might take some of it away for a while and the Arab nations might take some of it away for a while when the Lord Jesus comes it's all going to be given back to Israel verse 4 always makes me smile in this I can never read this without having a smile I have came into his house heavy and displeased because of the word which Naboth the Jezreelite had spoken to him for he had said I will not give the inheritance of my father's and he laid him down upon his bed and turned away his face and would eat no bread. The king of Israel is having a sulk like a two-year-old. Um, it, it's hard to believe it, isn't it? Here's a man that's supposed to be the ruler of the nation. He can't get a piece of land next to the palace, so he goes home and lies on his bed and refused to eat and has a sulk. You remember Saul also got sulky. Uh, when Saul found out about David's uh, popularity with the people and he starts to try to kill David, you find uh, that Saul more and more gets, gets um, to feel sorry for himself uh, and he comes to the place where he's, he's got such an attitude against David and he feels so sorry for himself that the Bible says the Lord sends a devil to trouble him. And of course, as you know, he has to send for David to soothe uh, to soothe him so that the, the devil flies away. Always interesting to me, it doesn't say that when David came to Saul, he sang psalms. It says he played upon the harp. And, and Saul's spirit was refreshed and the devil left him. And that tells me that the right kind of music is hated by devils. Um, personally, I think it's, it's classical music. That's my personal feeling. They ca devils can't stand classical music. 
they love rock music they're very much involved with rock music but clean music classical music for example they can't stand because all Davy did it doesn't say as I say it doesn't say he sang any song he just played the harp and Saul was refreshed and the devils left him there's another occasion later on I think I don't know it's Elijah or Elisha when he's asked to prophesy and he says fetch me a minstrel and as the minstrel plays the spirit of the Lord comes upon either Elijah or Elisha um, and so you know music's a wonderful thing and the right kind of music can actually be a blessing uh, to our spiritual lives can refresh us inwardly uh, it's, a, it's a lovely thing the right kind of music but on the same by the same token the wrong kind of music can do a lot of damage and is doing a lot of damage wrecking, wrecking the lives of young people uh, very much so these days so we, we have Ahab here feeling sorry for himself we have Saul feeling sorry for themselves and in both of those cases it led to great sin in this case it leads to murder and in Saul's case it leads to attempted murder and then in verse 5 we read but Jezebel his wife came to him and said unto him uh, and, it, and it is she as we've read that plots Naboth's murder and, orchestr and orchestrates his murder blackens his name calls him a blasphemer and just so wickedly gets him stoned you notice uh, nothing's much said about the character of Naboth here but clearly the fact that he will not let go of his inheritance would suggest that he was a man who was obedient to the Lord he was a man who took the law seriously suggests he was a godly man and yet you find that he's treated terribly here now Jezebel was the daughter of Ethbaal the king of the Zidonians we find from an earlier place and he was a worshipper of Baal and so was she and when she got married to Ahab uh, and that's counted a great sin in the scriptures we won't read that but she brings all the idolatry and the vicious worship of Baal with her to Israel um, and she was one of the great wicked characters of the Old Testament histories this Jezebel and, and she seems to fit to me most appropriately into the role of the great end time persecutor of the Jews called in Revelation 17 Mystery Babylon the mother of harlots um, I'm sorry to say this but women often in the scriptures represent false religions Jezebel the, the Mystery Babylon and others they often re represent false religions in the Bible if you'd like to look at me for example at Matthew 13 just for a moment Matthew 13 the parables of the kingdom they are verse 33 Matthew 13 says another parable spake he unto them the kingdom of heaven is like unto leaven which a woman took and hid in three measures of meal till the whole was leaven now some used to interpret this and years ago and some for all I know still do um, that the leaven is the gospel um, and that as the gospel is sown in the world so um, you know the, the, there's growth but that is to, to, to misuse the scriptures altogether because leaven in the Old Testament is a picture of sin it's to be got out of the house after the Passover they were to take all of the leaven out of the house and it, it spoke of sin and so it speaks of sin here and it's a woman who is hiding three measures of meal what is she what is she doing the three measures of meal may represent the person of Christ may represent the Holy Scriptures she's corrupting it she's introducing that which corrupts the gospel she's introducing that which um, what shall we say corrupts the person of the Lord Jesus Christ or seeks to do that um, and you'll find as, as uh, if you look at these prophets uh, these these prophecies these parables that the first ones that the Lord speaks out among the people are all about the growth of Christendom they're all about the development of evil uh, the fowls nesting in the branches and so on and so forth the tares among the wheat the, the leaven in the bread it's all speak of the growth of evil during these times later on when the Lord goes into the house he speaks to his disciples he talks more about what God is really doing rather than what it appears that he's doing outwardly so and you find this repeatedly you find women often a picture of corrupt religion and false religion in the scriptures particularly Babylon and Rome um, Naboth Na 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 of course uh, and we'll see this more clearly if you're not if you're not aware of this speaks very much of the Lord Jesus and uh, the Lord Jesus was betrayed of course by apostate Judaism and uh, put to death by the Roman government so you've got a you've got a, a sort of a um, what shall we say a partnership between Rome and 
apostate Judaism, Judaism uh, when the Lord was put to death. And that speaks of, spiritually, if you will, of the, of the plot of Jezebel against the Lord and against his people. And that's going to come again, uh, of course, in the, in the near future. If you just leave aside for a moment the, the historical tactics of, of Jezebel and think about what it means spiritually, uh, we find there's a picture painted of it in, in Proverbs chapter 7, which we'll spend a few moments looking at. Proverbs chapter 7 speaks very clearly about Jezebel, speaks very clearly about false religion, speaks very clearly about Babylon of the last days, speaks very clearly about opposition to the Jews and, and the, the, the desire to steal um, the inheritance. So Proverbs chapter 7. Um, and as we read this, we're going to read about a strange woman here uh, who is, who is a, a, a harlot um, and she speaks of false religion. And as we, as we read about her, think in terms of religious apostasy, think in terms of end time apostasy, and you'll be amazed what will come out. Proverbs 7, then we'll start to read at verse 5. Uh, that, that they may keep thee from the strange woman, from the stranger which flattereth with her words. For at the window of my house I looked through my casement and beheld among the simple ones, I discerned among the youths a young man void of understanding, passing through the street near her corner, and he went the way to her house, in the twilight, in the evening, in the black and dark night. And behold, there met him a woman with the attire of an harlot and subtle of heart. She is loud and stubborn, her feet abide not in her house. Now is she without, now in the streets, and lieth in wait at every corner. So she caught him and kissed him, and with an impudent face said unto him, I have peace offerings with me, this day have I paid my vows. Therefore came I forth to meet thee, diligently to seek thy face, and I have found thee. I have decked my bed with coverings of tapestry, with carved works, with fine linen of Egypt. I have perfumed my bed with myrrh, aloes, and cinnamon. Come, let us take our fill of love until the morning. Let us solace ourselves with loves. For the good man is not at home, he has got a long journey. She's speaking of her husband, of course. He has taken a bag of money with him and will come home at the day appointed. With her much fair speech, she caused him to yield. With the flattering of her lips, she forced him. He goeth after her straightway as an ox goeth to the slaughter or as a fool to the correction of the stocks, till a dart strike through his liver, as a bird hasteth to the snare, and knoweth not that it is for his life. Hearken unto me now therefore, O ye children, and attend to the words of my mouth. Let not thine heart decline to her ways, go not astray in her paths, for she hath cast down many wounded, yea, many strong men have been slain by her. Her house is the way to hell, going down to the chambers of death. Just a few warnings then I, I want to pick up on here because this woman speaks to me very much of the end time apostasy and, and the religious corruption that is designed to take the faithful away from the Lord. First of all, note what it says in verse 5 about this woman, from the stranger, the strange woman, from the stranger which flattereth with her words. And also it says in verse 21, with her much fair speech she caused him to yield with the flattering of her lips, she forced him. Have a look with me at Romans chapter 16. Romans chapter 16. And we'll see this in New Testament terms. This flattery. Romans chapter 16, verse 17. Romans 16 and verse 17. Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offences contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned, and avoid them. For they, they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, and by good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. So here we've got religious frauds, we've got relig religious apostates, and just like that woman... With fair words, good words and fair speeches, they deceive the hearts of the simple. John Trapp comments, better to, be, better to be preserved in brine than to rot in honey. <laughs> That's so good. That's so true. 
And um, I'm not very popular as a speech because as a preacher because there's a bit bit too much brine I think sometimes in what I have to say and folks like honey these days but the Bible says too much honey is not good for you. That's what it says in the book of Proverbs. Uh, hast, thou found, hast thou found honey? It says eat a little, lest thou vomit it up. And people are in so many places now are going after these fair speeches and these good words and all they get is honey. And uh, it's better to be preserved in brine, says the trap, than to rot in honey. Also in verse 10, back to Proverbs 7, looking at what this woman has to say to us again about uh, modern apostasy, verse 10 of chapter 7 of Proverbs, And behold, there met him a woman with the attire of an harlot, of course, this is a prostitute, and subtle of heart. Have a look at Revelation chapter 17, where we read about Mystery Babylon, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. And let's see what he says about her there. Revelation 17 and verse 4. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet colour, and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. She's wearing loud clothes. Now, loud clothes bespeak a loud character. Um, says in verse 11 of our reading in, in Proverbs, she is loud and stubborn. Her feet abide not in her house. False religion is invariably noisy and boastful. Um, I don't know what some of these churches would do if it wasn't for electricity. You know, those churches, they've got a band, they've got floodlights. If the electricity went off, some of them wouldn't be able to have a service. They'd be stumped. Um, and false religion, is, it seems to me, it, seems, it loves a lot of noise. It loves to make a big noise. Uh, and it's very boastful too. But compare that with what Peter says in his first letter in chapter 3. So we're just going left a bit from... Um, the Revelation, of course, just after Hebrews, we get Peter and his first letter. And I'm going to read to you from chapter 3. First Peter chapter 3, verse 1. Likewise, ye wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word... They also may, without the word, be won by the conversation of the wives. Now, that might seem like a contradiction, but conversation means behaviour in the King James Bible. So it's let the husband watch your behaviour rather than to keep trying to witness to him or keep trying to straighten him out. Verse 2, while they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear, whose adorning, let it not be that outward adorning of plaiting the hair and of wearing of gold or of putting on of a paddle, but let it be the hidden man of the heart in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit which is in the sight of God of great price. For after this manner in the old time, the holy women also who trusted in God adorned themselves, being in subjection unto their own husbands. Modest female dress, especially the putting aside of gold and pearls, is fast disappearing even in the US churches, leave alone the churches over here. You sometimes, if you watch some, even, even the, some of the comparatively sound US churches, uh, if you watch as the camera pans around sometimes on those congregations, even where the preaching is reasonably sound, uh, the women are not dressed as Peter exhorts them to dress here. Very often they're covered in makeup, they wear all kinds of jewellery and earrings and so on and so forth. Uh, and it may not seem important, and some woman might say, well, you know, you're making a mountain out of a molehill. No, I'm not. I've only spoken about this twice in two years, and, I, and then only in passing. So I'm not making a mountain of it at all. But what about obeying the word of God? That's my answer. Mm. What about obeying the word of God? I used to wear gold when I got saved. I had an expensive 24 gallon gold, gold cross. And I had expensive rings, gold rings. I took them off. Because the Bible says, well, the women are not supposed to dress up, so I presume the men are not supposed to dress up either. And it's interesting that we also read about Jezebel, we won't turn there, but she painted her face. Later on, when she gets her comeuppance, we find that she's painted her face. I don't know whether she was open to, um, uh, to Paul, uh, Jehu, who'd come to, come to bump her off, and we'll, we'll talk about that a bit later. Excuse my living Bible terminology here, won't you? Uh, but Jehu was sent 
uh, to deal with her and with her husband. Um, or rather, it's, it's, it's later on, I think, I don't know if it was her husband or a, a later king. Um, but you find she painted her face and looked out the window. Uh, and of all the women in the Bible, I think, as far as I know, she's the only one of whom it says she painted her face. And that's common practice nowadays. Why not, why not please the Lord? That's my question. Okay, it might not be a big deal, but why not do what God says? If we really mean business with God, why don't we make every effort to do everything we know he's called us to do that pleases him? Anyway, let's get back to um, Proverbs 7 still, thinking about apostasy. Back to Proverbs 7 and in verse 13. We read, so she caught him and kissed him. You remember Judas kissed the Lord Jesus. Um, and that's, that's what false religion is like. It's always blowing kisses. Um, it will certainly preach God is love. Uh, but the words God is holy, they don't seem to be able to pronounce. Or God is just doesn't seem to fit their vocabulary. But God is love, that's all of their message. And it reminds me of those, those Ephraimites who couldn't pronounce the word shibboleth. Apostate religious leaders can't say God is holy. Verse 16, she says, I have decked my bed with coverings of tapestry, with carved works, with fine linen of Egypt. So she was also wealthy. Um, and, you know, so much of modern corrupt religion boasts of its wealth. The Roman Catholic Church, I don't know if you're familiar, some of you won't be familiar, I imagine, with the works of Avro Manhattan. I don't know whether Avro Manhattan was a believer, but he wrote some very interesting books. And one of them was called The Vatican Billions. Um, and the Vatican Church is worth untold billions. I would not personally be at all surprised if some of the stuff that was stolen from the Jews during the war was housed somewhere in the Vatican. Uh, because Hitler was a Catholic, many of his right-hand men were Catholics. The Catholics helped many of the Nazis to escape when the war was over. Uh, there were things called rat runs uh, from which the Nazis got away from the Allies after the war. And very often Catholic priests were involved in getting those Nazis out. Um, and Hitler was a very, very confident Catholic. So I wouldn't be at all surprised if some of the monies that was taken from the Jews, the gold teeth and all the rest of it, isn't housed somewhere in the Vatican. It's worth a fortune. She's a wealthy woman. Um, and, and false religions are usually opulent. They usually make a great deal of their wealth. Uh, and they can point to big buildings and big churches. Um, and men who are not seriously searching for the truth are often duped by this. Just like this woman took this man in. He was young and void of understanding. And we must study the scriptures if we want to understand. We must study the scriptures. We must ask the Lord's help if we want to see through the deception. Because the deception is strong now. And it comes in the name of Christianity. No, I'm not talking just about the Catholic Church. Even many of the so-called evangelical churches. The charismatic churches. So many of them have gone um, sour. They've gone apostate. Uh, and if we're not careful to study the scriptures, we're going to get led astray like this young man was. So men who are not seriously searching for the truth are often taken in by wealthy religion. But what, what, what happens when you look at the Lord Jesus Christ? On one occasion you find him saying, show me a penny. <laughs> where's the, where's the, see, nothing to boast of there. So different, so different from so many who profess to be the Lords these days. Particularly the naming and claiming people. Uh, particularly the wonder workers and all the rest of them who've got so much wealth and are telling their folks that they can have God wants them rich and so on and so forth so far removed from the life that the Lord Jesus lived so far removed from what he taught and what the Apostle Paul taught and then looking back at uh, Proverbs 7 and verse 19 um, it says the good man is not at home uh, and false religion says don't worry just now about Jesus coming back there's time for pleasure. Let's compare that, what it says there in verse 19. The good man is not at home with what it says in Matthew 21. Let's go there. Matthew 21. Which we read a little bit earlier, but we're not going to read that whole portion again. But verse 33 there, that the Lord Jesus says... Here another parable, there was a certain householder 
which planted a vineyard and hedged it round about and digged a wine press in it and built a tower and let it out to husbandmen and went into a far country. And she says, the good man is not at home, he has gone a long journey. And false religion, rather like those in Exodus 32, what has become of Moses? They're not looking for the coming of the Lord, they're trying to enjoy themselves. And we looked recently, didn't we, at uh, Elisha and, and Gehazi, and we remember how that after Elisha had healed Naam and the Syrian, that Gehazi went after him to get some payment, to get some reward. And Elisha rebukes him and said, this is not the time to be getting possessions. This is not the time for olive yards and, cat um, for olive yards and vineyards and cattle and so on and so forth. But she says, the good man's gone, he's not coming back. Let's enjoy ourselves. And this again is apostate religion. And finally, in Proverbs 7, in verse 27, there it says, her house is the way to hell. A strange thing, isn't it, that, that those who are saying that this is the way to heaven are leading people to hell. The Catholic Church, which claims, you know, there's no salvation outside of the Catholic Church, is leading untold millions to hell. The Muslims who claim that, um, you know, you've got to believe in, in Muhammad and you've got to believe in Allah to go uh, to heaven are going, for the most part, to hell. In fact, if they don't trust Christ, they're going to hell. Whether they be moderate or whether they be fanatical, whether they be murderers and, and uh, bum, bummers or whether they just be ordinary, nice, pleasant ca uh, Muslim people, and we know lots of them, sadly they're going to hell. Mm. What a deceit, what a deceit it is that young men are prepared to blow themselves up and kill dozens of people, even hundreds of people, because they have been told that there's 72 virgins waiting for them in heaven when they get there and they're sure to go to heaven if they kill the infidels and the unbelievers. What deception that is and what a shock those poor men are going to have. And I don't use the term poor men in any kind of complimentary way. What a shock they're going to have the moment they've blown themselves limb from limb to find themselves in the grip of Satan and carried down to the hottest parts of hell where they will remain forever for their murderous activities. How anybody can believe that that religion is from the Lord, how anybody can believe that the Lord Jesus Christ, holy, harmless and undefiled, could give approval to that kind of murderous behaviour is absolutely beyond me. But let's go back to First Kings again now and pick up with Jezebel in 1 Kings 21 verse 8 so she wrote letters in Ahab's name and sealed them with his seal and sent letters unto the elders and to the nobles that were in his city dwelling with Naboth so she's abusing now royal authority she's the king's wife she's the queen she's abusing her, her authority and this is always the end result of false religion as it is with totalitarian government just like Islam does and Rome does, it will kill those who truly love the Lord for the opportunity to seize, to seize their land. And it's all about land here, and it's going to be all about land come the tribulation. Uh, they want the land. The Antichrist wants the land. Russia will want the land. I think Russia's going to be involved. It's all about the land. Um, but notice the slaying of the innocent. Look at verse 13 then in... Um, in our chapter 1 Kings 21, here's the slaying of, of Naboth. There came in two men, children of Belial, and sat before him. And the men of Belial witnessed against him, even against Naboth, in the presence of the people, saying, Naboth did blaspheme God and the king. Then they carried him forth out of the city and stoned him with stones that he died. So we have the slaying now of an innocent man. And two witnesses blaspheme. They, they say he blasphemed God and they speak against him. Come now to Matthew 26, and we'll see that that is unquestionably a clear picture of the treatment that the Saviour, the Lord Jesus, received, and Naboth is clearly, therefore, a type prophetically of the things that were to come to the Lord Jesus. Matthew 26, and verse uh, 59. Now the chief priests and elders and all the council sought false witness against Jesus to put him to death, but found none. Yea, though many false witnesses came, yet found there none. At the last came two false witnesses and said, This fellow said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and to build it in three days. 
And the high priest arose and said unto him, Answerest thou nothing? What is it which these witness against thee? But Jesus held his peace. You know Naboth doesn't speak, does he? You don't, you don't hear Naboth defending himself. It's a picture of the Lord. Jesus held his peace. And the high priest answered and said unto him, I adjure thee by the living God that thou tell us whether thou be the Christ, the Son of God. Then the high priest rent his cloak, I beg your pardon, verse 64. Jesus saith unto him, Thou hast said, Nevertheless I say unto you, Hereafter shall you see the Son of Man, sitting on the right hand of power, and coming in the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest rent his clothes, saying, He has spoken blasphemy. What further need have we of witnesses? Behold, now ye have heard is a blasphemy. The same charge that was charged against uh, Naboth, uh, it says that the two witnesses in the presence of the people say Naboth did blaspheme, excuse me, blaspheme God and the king. The Lord Jesus is charged with blaspheming God. Naboth pictures Jesus then the innocent victim of the abuse of justice and the rightful inheritor robbed of his lands. Read verses 15 and 16 now in our chapter again, 1 Kings 21 verse 15, and it came to pass when Jezebel heard that Naboth was stoned and was dead, that Jezebel said to Ahab, Arise, take possession of the vineyard of Naboth the Jezreelite, which he refused to give thee for money. For Naboth is not alive, but dead. And it came to pass, when Ahab heard that Naboth was dead, that Ahab rose up to go down to the vineyard of Naboth the Jezreelite to take possession of it. You see, it's all about the land. Carnal men and women can never get their eyes up to heaven. Have a look at John chapter 11. John's Gospel, chapter 11. I've not got far to go now. John's Gospel, chapter 11. Carnal men and women can never get their eyes up to heaven. It's always about land. John 11, John's Gospel, chapter 11, verse 47. Then gathered the chief priests and the Pharisees a council and said, What do we for this man doeth many miracles? If we let him thus alone, all men will believe on him. And the Romans shall come and take away both our place and nation. Their concern is the land and their, um, shall we say, their national pride. The nation is far more concerned to them than the holiness of God. Far more concerned to them than the Lord Jesus Christ. And, you know, men still suppose today that their nations will prosper if they get rid of Jesus. And it won't work in Israel and it won't work here. Now, every effort has been made here to ensure that neither Naboth nor his children would inherit that land. Have a look with me at 2 Kings now, and we'll see what it's got to say about his children. 2 Kings chapter 9. 2 Kings chapter 9. And I want to read a few verses here, because I'm going to make a number of comments on this to close. 2 Kings 9, let's read at verse 16. So Jehu rode in a chariot and went to Jezreel. Remember that Naboth's ground was in Jezreel. For Jordan lay there, and Ahaziah king of Judah was come down to see Jordan. And there stood a watchman on the tower in Jezreel, and he spied the company of Jehu as he came and said, I see a company. And Joram said, Take an horseman and send to meet them, and let him say, Is it peace? So they went one on horseback to meet him and said, Thus said the king, Is it peace? And Jehu said, What hast thou to do with peace? Turn thee behind me. And the watchman told, saying, The messenger came to them, but he cometh not again. Then he sent out a second on horseback, which came to them and said, Thus said the king, Is it peace? And Jehu answered, What hast thou to do with peace? Turn thee behind me. And the watchman told, saying, Ye came even unto them, and cometh not again. And the driving is like the driving of Jehu, the son of Nimshi, for he driveth furiously. And Jordan said, Make ready. And his chariot was made ready. And Jordan, king of Israel, and Ahaziah, king of Judah, went out, each in his chariot, and they went out against Jehu, and met him in the portion of Naboth the Jezreelite. And it came to pass, when Jordan saw Jehu, that he said, Is it peace, Jehu? And he answered, What peace so long as the whoredoms of thy mother Jezebel and her witchcrafts are so many? And Jordan turned his hands and fled and said to Ahaziah, There is treachery, O Ahaziah. 
And Jehu drew a bow with his full strength and smote Jehoram between his arms and the arrow went out at his heart and he sunk down in his chariot. Then said Jehu to Bidkar, his captain, take up and cast him in the portion of the field of Naboth the Jezreelite. For remember how that, how that when I and thou rode together after Ahab his father, the Lord laid this burden on him. Listen now, surely I have seen yesterday the blood of Naboth and the blood of his sons, saith the Lord. I will requite thee in this plat, saith the Lord. Now therefore take and cast him into the plat of ground, according to the word of the Lord. To make sure that the inheritance never went back to Naboth. We're not told in the earlier chapters, but not only was Naboth killed, we're told here his sons also were killed, so that there would be no chance of the inheritance being taken up by Naboth's family. And so it is today that, that Jezebel, or apostate religion, thinks she's disposed of Jesus, and has been for centuries disposing of his children, that is to say those who are the Lord's by faith. And anyone who would claim the earth for the Lord Jesus Christ, as the Bible says, maketh himself a prey. The Roman Catholic Church seems to think that they are, they're going to inherit everything that belongs to Israel. They seem to think that they are Israel. That's why Israel in chapter 12 of Revelation is pictured with a crown of 12 stars. This is the sign of the European Union, of course, which is built on the Club of Rome and is very much backed by Roman Catholicism. They think that they are the kingdom of God uh, and they think that they're going to take the land. Now, Elijah, we read it when we read at the start in 1 Kings 21. Elijah warned Ahab. And it, it's interesting as well that though he just lay on his bed clutching his teddy and sucking his thumb, when Jezebel arranged the murder of Naboth, Ahab was held responsible. He should have kept his wife in order, and a man is reckoned by the Lord the master of his house. And uh, won't be tied that family where the woman's in charge, where the woman wears the trousers. Somebody said, we have a 50-50 relationship in our house. I tell my wife where to go, and she tells me what to do. No, I tell my wife what to do, and she tells me where to go. Well, that's, that's never going to work. A 50-50 relationship is never going to work. And because Ahab was not the head of his house, he is rebuked. She's done all the dirty work. He kept his mouth shut and let her do it. He's the one that's rebuked. He's held responsible. And so we read in the New Testament in the, in the pastoral epistles that an elder should have his children in subjection with all authority. Now I, I believe that Naboth will have, personally, I might be wrong about this, but I believe that Naboth is going to get that plot back when he comes back with the Lord in the millennium. Because it's his. It's his by right. It's been taken from him, but he's going to get it back. And it might be that the Antichrist will take some lands from Israel, but when the Saviour comes, they'll get it back. Naboth and every other murdered saint shall come in the, arms, in the armies of heaven with Jesus at his second coming. Let's just have a look at that. We're almost at a finish now. Revelation 19. <coughs> Revelation 19. Saw something that blessed me here today. Revelation 19 verse 11. This is the coming of the Saviour, the second coming. Not the rapture, but the second coming. Verse 11, Revelation 19. And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a great white horse. And he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he does judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth go the sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Let's just go back <coughs> to Second Kings 9 again. The story of Jehu and this killing of these kings. And let's just read one verse there in the light of what we've just read in Revelation 19. Second Kings chapter 9. And I want to read just the verse 20 again, which speaks of Jehu's coming. And the watchman told, saying, He came even unto them, and cometh not again. And the driving is like the driving of Jehu, the son of Nimshi, for he driveth furiously. And when the Lord comes out of heaven on his white horse, he's going to frighten men to death. 
This one who was the Lamb of God, this one who was quiet, this one who meekly went to his death, is going to come out of heaven like Jehu comes here. And it says, the driving is like the Jehu, the son of Nimshi, for he driveth furiously. And we read also um, in verse 24 that Jehu drew a bow with his full strength and smote Jehoram between his arms and the arrow went out of his heart and he sunk down in his chariot. The Lord Jesus is gentle and he's merciful and he's gracious and there's an opportunity for people to be saved right now. But when the time comes, he's going to come like Jehu and he's going to come armed and he's going to come fearful and he's going to frighten the living daylights out of all those who have mocked him. He's going to frighten the living daylights out of the Antichrist when he comes, as we've read there in, in uh, Revelation 19. So we have an old, an old Testament lesson here that the saints may suffer a rough ride now, but we shall ride behind the Saviour who was murdered like Naboth. But when he comes like Jehu, he drives furiously. People need to trust him now and receive his salvation while the door of salvation is still open. When judgment comes, it will be swift and it will be furious. And that one, you know, I remember somebody saying to me years ago, and I, funnily I always think about Gene's dad when, when I think of this phrase, beware the anger of a patient man. And Gene's dad was a mild-mannered fellow and a gentle chap. Um, but I guess, I mean, Gene would know better than I that if he lost his temper, you know, I'd... Um, beware the anger of a patient man and the Lord Jesus has been so patient God has been so patient but when the door of opportunity shuts and he comes out of heaven the Bible says he driveth furiously and it will be a fearful sight indeed to see him coming in the glory better to trust the Lord now receive mercy now and grace now than judgment then because if we won't have mercy we will surely have judgment those are the only two options Amen Thank you.